the last talk of the day. Thank you for everyone, uh, to everyone for staying this late. Uh, my name is Mark Fernandez. I work for MITRE Corporation. MITRE is a not-for-profit corporation that operates several feder federally funded research and development centers on behalf of the federal government. In autumn of last year, I started working on a new project that involved building a protocol analyzer for BRO. I had never used BRO before, so there was a bit of a learning curve, but I was excited to, uh, it sounded like the project was gonna be a lot of fun, and looking back on it, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed learning the new system, I enjoyed learning the new programming languages like BroScript and BinPack, uh, and I just learned what BinPack stood for uh, this morning during Seth's talk. <laughs> Tried Googling that acronym, could never find the breakout for it, what it actually meant. Um, but more importantly, uh, for my customer, this project you know, has had a, a great impact on their ability to monitor and analyze the traffic on their network because with HTTPS traffic, there is a significant blind spot. Um, and it's yielded a lot of successes. Um, they've detected several incidences that without this tool, they, they wouldn't have been able to detect otherwise. Um, and best of all, both my customer and my company are very keen to share this project back with the open source community. So that's, <laughs> Thanks. So that's why I'm here today to, to discuss the Bro Internet Content Adaptation Protocol Analyzer. The subtitle is a, a novel method for monitoring HTTPS traffic in plain text. And what do I mean by that? I call it a novel method because we're not doing any cryptanalysis, we're not doing any decryption or anything sophisticated or advanced like that. It's just simply recognizing that the ICAP protocol already contained the information that we needed inside the payload, so all I had to do is write a protocol parser to extract it. Uh, kind of the problem statement, again, encrypted web traffic presents a very a big blind spot for cybersecurity analysts, network defenders, um, you know, when the boss or the CEO wants to know if his network or her network is defended, how can you answer that with any satisfaction knowing that there's, you know, such a significant part of your network traffic that you can't inspect or you can't monitor? And uh, the gentleman this morning had some of the great statistics about how, how much HTTPS traffic is on the rise and what a percentage increase from previous years and so on. So those were good statistics. I didn't uh, track those down to include in this talk. But as you all know, it's also that increases the uh, potential vector for external threats and internal threats to be operating and, and exploiting different things. Um, your countermeasure for it, you know, from a defense an a perspective, the best countermeasure would be uh, to invest in a, in a security device that does SSL interception. Um, have that on your network and then that would break out the traffic and you'd be able to do your intrusion detections, uh, signatures, your anomaly detection and all the other good stuff you would ordinarily do if the traffic wasn't encrypted originally. Um, but the problem or the challenge continues because not everybody has uh, those devices on their network. Not everyone has the resources to invest or procure in those devices. They don't have the budgets. They, maybe they don't have the personnel. Um, some of those restrictions. So with that being the goal, you know, having that kind of appliance on your network. What can you do in the interim? What can you do till you get there? Well, a lot of folks have web proxies on their network. And a lot of web proxies are capable of doing the SSL interception. And a lot of them are capable of interfacing with content inspection services on the back end so that you could do antivirus or malware inspection of the web traffic um, that's being proxied. Or you could do data loss prevention of the traffic that's going out of your network. And if you fall into that category, if you have a web proxy that you know, has, meets that criteria in your environment, then the Bro ICAP analyzer would be suitable to use uh, to increase the visibility on your network. So the outline of the talk, I'll, I'll go into the ICAP protocol a little bit, um, talk about its basic operations. I have some illustrations and, uh, about ICAP implementation within web proxies and the content inspection devices. And then I'll talk about the Bro uh, ICAP analyzer and you know, what we care about the ICAP protocol because the, the RFC you know, describes a lot of things. Maybe we don't care about everything that it describes. <clears throat> we want to focus on a few things that are useful. I'll talk about uh, using BINPAC uh, to create the, the ICAP analyzer. And then there are some limitations and, and maybe some caveats I wanted to describe as well and recommendations for future work. 
The ICAP protocol was created back in 2003, RFC uh, 3507, but it's intended to modify HTTP messages, HTTP requests, HTTP responses. Uh, it operates over port 1344, and it, the syntax is very similar to HTTP. And the common implementations I described earlier, you could use it for antivirus inspection of inbound traffic or data loss prevention inspection of, of outbound traffic to your network. Um, those are some of the specific use cases, I think, that, uh, that the ICAP protocol is, is implemented for. It's got two basic modes of operation, request modification and response modification. Um, and interesting, the RFC defines the ICAP payload and request modification mode. The ICAP payload is going to have the HTTP request header from the client, and if applicable, the HTTP request body will be present as well. And an interesting quirk in the RFC is that the body section must be chunk encoded. So whether the original HTTP message was chunk encoded or not, um, once it's encapsulated in the ICAP payload, it must be chunk encoded. So that puts a, a, a constraint or a requirement on the ICAP analyzer to then be able to recognize what was the original transfer encoding for the original message. Um, and if it was not chunk encoded, then we had to take all those chunks, reassemble it before we send it off to the bro HTTP analyzer. In response modification mode, the RFC says that the ICAP payload can contain up to three objects or three entities, the original client request header, the server response header, and the server response body if it's present. And again, the body must be uh, chunk encoded. I have a few animations, illustrations, hopefully, uh, it you know, further gets the point across. So we have very simple network diagram. We have a web client at the bottom. We have a web proxy that acts as the ICAP client. Um, and in this case, for request modification mode, the ICAP server would be like a data loss prevention device. And then there's the web server out on the public internet somewhere. So the whole thing starts with the, with the web client issuing a request. The proxy intercepts it, and it's going to proxy that request. And in request modification mode, it's going to go ahead and you know, take the HTTP header and HTTP body, separate them, put them in the payload, and send it over to the ICAP server for, for inspection. And there will be some security policy on that device that will say this is allowed, this isn't allowed. And if everything checks out, the ICAP server will respond back to the web proxy and say, hey, uh, status 204, no modifications needed. And then the web proxy can continue with the HTTP transaction. But there could be a case where you know, policy says, hey, whatever the, the user is trying to send out of the network in the body, that's prohibited. We're not allowed. There's intellectual property. There's maybe social security number. You know, whatever kind of inf personnel records, whatever kind of information um, that's denied by policy to go out of the network, the ICAP server would flag it. And it can modify the content as necessary um, and send a modified body back to the web proxy. And then the web proxy would continue with the HTTP transaction using the modified body. Um, now, response modification mode. This one has a, has a few more parts to it. It starts again with the web client at the bottom, but the proxy is going to go ahead and let the request go out. And then when it gets the response from the internet, there it's going to pause. And it'll create the ICAP payload, and it'll have the original client request header, the server response body, and the or server response header and the response body. It'll take all of those entities, package it up into an ICAP payload and send it to the ICAP server, which again, in this case, in response modification mode, you could think of that as an antivirus uh, or malware detection device. If everything checks out, it'll send the status 204, no modifications needed, back to the proxy, and the proxy will send you know, whatever content came down from the internet. It'll send it back to the client. In the case where maybe there is a policy violation, there was malware detected in the messages coming back from the server, it could, again, put modified content. That could be just an HTTP. It could be an error message. It could be you know, modifying the content completely. And that modified message would go back down to the client. Um, and how does Bro fit into all of this? Well, the Bro ICAP analyzer, we're going to modify or we're going to monitor that link between the web proxy and the content inspection device. Um, and that's going to, uh, I'll talk about it more later on, but that's going to you know, affect some things like uh, your IP addresses, your port numbers, because by monitoring that, everything's going to have the IP addresses of the web proxy and the other device. You're not going to get 
necessarily the original client and the original server. So there's going to be a, f a few things we have to, uh, have to account for. <clears throat> references, I put references here in the middle because there's you know, some of these documents I used to learn everything I could about the ICAP protocol before <clears throat> writing the analyzer. There's the original RFC. There it's listed as 3507 correctly. And there are a couple of other documents <clears throat> that are listed as draft. One is on the IETF website. It's still listed as a draft document, even though it was posted back in 2003 with some ICAP extensions. And um, those ICAP extensions are actually implemented by different vendors as well currently. So it, it was a useful reference to use. And then there's a kind of a lessons learned web page that I found as well out on measurementfactory.com that uh, applied to the ICAP protocol. And going back, ICAP does a lot of things. Um, what's the objectives of the ICAP analyzer? One, we're monitoring the link between the web proxy and the antivirus or data loss prevention proxy. Um, we want to extract the HTTPS messages from the ICAP payload because that's currently what we can't see. We could use Bro you know, located at other parts of the network to see the regular HTTP traffic. It's this HTTPS traffic that we care about most because we can't see that. So that's what we want to target through the uh, ICAP payload or through the ICAP analyzer. And then once we pull the, those messages, the HTTP, out of the ICAP payload, then we want to shove it back into the Bro HTTP analyzer to get all, get all the benefit of what Bro would have done otherwise. You know, you get the advantage of the MIME analyzer and the file analyzer, and you get all the other logs that Bro would ordinarily produce. Uh, ICAP methods, you know, I mentioned the syntax is very similar to HTTP. Um, it doesn't have nearly as many methods as HTTP. The, there's really only got three that are defined in the RFC. That's request modification, response modification, and options. And one of those draft extension documents defined a log method. And as far as the Bro analy or the ICAP analyzer is concerned, options and log don't really care about because that doesn't contain any HTTP package or message information. We really only care about the first two methods. Uh, status codes, almost identical to the HTTP status codes. In fact, I think the RFC just references the, H the HTTP RFC. The only big difference is that status 204 was kind of redefined to be no modifications needed. I don't know what it was originally defined under HTTP, but they kind of they usurped that code. And that's what you'll see most of the time. If everything is well, there's no policy violations, you'll see a, a status 204. ICAP headers, so 35, RFC 3507 defines a lot of different headers you could see in the ICAP. Uh, some are specific to ICAP request messages. You know, the center column is specific to ICAP response messages that come from the server back to the client. And then some are specific to the ICAP options. Um, and some are in common across all three of them. And really, the ones that we care about for analysis, the ones that I care about for analysis are the encapsulated header because that tells you what the structure of the ICAP payload is. It tells you if there's a request header, a response header, response body, request body, those kind of things. It tells you the structure, and it's definitely important for the analyzer to know what to pull out and to know how to identify each of those pieces. The two extension documents, uh, the draft ones, those have a few more headers defined and a couple of them really got my attention. Um, client IP and server IP, those are really good ones because we're, we had that limitation before monitoring the link between the web proxy and the content inspection device. We bro sees those IP addresses. But now from the ICAP headers, the extended headers, we could get the client IP of the original internal host that was issuing that web request. And it also has the server IP of the external uh, web server that's responding to that request. And I was really excited to see the authenticated user. Um, and certain web proxies require a user to authenticate before they could be allowed to the web proxy, before they could be allowed to, to access the internet. And having that bit of information present in the ICAP header, I think, was a big advantage. Because it's knowable. That information is discoverable, but you have to go through a lot more steps. You have the, the client IP address, and then you have to go back to your DHCP logs to find out what workstation had that IP address during that time. And then you have to go through your Active Directory logs to see what user logged into that workstation during that time. So all that information is discoverable, but this makes it available right up front. So when you find malicious web traffic, you know exactly which user was affected, and you can track it down and remediate it a lot faster. 
Um, a couple of other interesting ones that I haven't seen operationally, but that exist in the extensions document are the infection found, violations found, and virus IDs. Um, and again, this document defined the log method, but I mentioned earlier, we kind of ignore that, that method if it occurs. So what does it look like on the wire if you're doing a packet capture of the ICAP protocol? Uh, this is what it looks like. Um, this is some of the stuff that we saw with the specific uh, web proxy uh, product that we had. The start of it is the request line, a lot like an HTTP message. It has the ICAP method, the ICAP URI, and the ICAP version. The version is always 1.0 because that's the only version defined. There's been no updates to that RFC. And the URI is, is actually like, I mean, it's, it, the scheme is ICAP. So it's ICAP colon slash slash and then the IP or name of the server and then whatever other you know, path might be there. Um, so that's largely uninteresting. Uh, down in the ICAP headers is where you see the client IP, the server IP, authenticated user, and the encapsulated header. And again, in the case specifically for response modification mode, it would have those other three entities uh, in the payload encapsulated. And then the reply packet for response modification mode would look like that. It has a response line, has a status code and the reason, and it has a lot of other fields. Um, it's kind of interesting that they have apparent data types, so it looks like they try to you know, determine the MIME type, but Bro also gives you that as well. Um, it's just a neat second uh, set of information. Now looking at the encapsulated header, this is a very important field that, that we put in the ICAP logs, and that is very significant when parsing the ICAP payload to know what, what entities we have from the original client request and the server response. Down here at the bottom for uh, response modification mode, it's kind of what it looks like. It's a string that starts with encapsulated colon. That lets you know that that's what the header name is, and it's uh, terminated with a carriage return line feed. And it'll have request header equals zero, meaning it starts the request header is starting at byte zero of the ICAP payload. Response header is starting at byte 440 or an offset of 440 um, of the ICAP payload. And then the response body starts at an offset of 990. So from this information, you could infer that, hey, the request header is 440 bytes long. The response header is 550 bytes long. Um, and unfortunately, you can't make any inference on the size of the body section. Um, but because it's chunk encoded, it has, you know, the, the way the chunk encoded is you have a length field followed by the data and a length field followed by the data, and you just kind of, you know, keep going along until the length field is zero, and then you know you've run out of chunks. Um, oh, one important part of that is uh, according in the RFC in the blue section there, it says only one body can be encapsulated with the ICAP payload. So you will never have uh, the client request body and the server response body, you'll never have those in the same ICAP message. The RFC doesn't allow it. And now moving on to, to building the Bro Analyzer, or the ICAP Analyzer. We, we had a Linux CentOS server, eight core CPU, and two uh, one gigabit NICs. We used Bro 241, set up a local cluster with one manager, one proxy, and six worker pinned, and uh, used, set up with PF ring. And bin pack, we use version 0 0.44 we got from the Bro website, and also use the bin pack quick start guide um, that I found off of Vlad's uh, GitHub page. And once we set it up and started adding source code and building and compiling things, this is kind of all, the, the whole package of everything that I got once uh, I had to add a few, a few files to it. But there's a lot to it when you use the, the, the bin pack framework. It gives you some C files, some plugin, gives you a plugin C++ file to be able to, I guess, add the analyzer as a plugin to Bro. It has a lot of those .pac files. Those are the bin pack files that uh, it was a, it was a different, different type of language that was, uh, that was very fun to learn. I'm not going to go over all of these source code files. I just wanted to kind of throw up there what the... Uh, a lot of them were auto-generated that I then had to add, and I added a few other ones or had to modify. I want to talk a little bit about, about these four. Um, before I do that, I'll talk about the ICAP events that are generated um, and stuff that gets put into the weird log. Uh, the ICAP events, 
that the analyzer generates are very similar to the HTTP events. I use that as a model. I see what does bro, what kind of events does bro give you for HTTP, and I, I modeled it very similarly. So whenever the ICAP request line gets parsed, an event gets generated. Um, whenever the ICAP response line gets parsed, an event gets generated that contains that information. Whenever an ICAP header, just one of those single line headers like the encapsulated or any of those other ones, um, whenever those gets parsed by the, the underlying subsystem, then an event gets generated. Um, whenever it encounters an ICAP options, I mean, I'm kind of interested because I've never seen that um, operationally, but uh, an event gets generated for that as well, just in case someone down the road can make use of that information or sees, you know, finds a way that, hey, that really helps me in my analysis. I'm gonna take that information and do something good. I couldn't figure out anything good to do with it, but I created the event anyway. Um, ICAP body weird. That was an event I, I generated because, uh, which actually came in useful once I started running it and started encountering these null body fields that I didn't encounter under certain scenarios. But it's basically the code that goes through the encapsulated header fields and figures out what does the payload, the ICAP payload, how is it structured, what does it look like. The code that does that, if it encounters a combination of headers and, and bodies and other things that it's never seen before, that's, that, that kind of goes against what's in the RFC, it'll generate that weird event that, hey, I see an ICAP body that I don't understand. It kind of goes against what's documented previously. Um, I also ended up generating an ICAP chunk weird. This was, this was a weird one. So knowing that when passing the body, the, the, the HTTP body has to be chunk encoded when it's in the ICAP payload, but it may not have originally been chunk encoded when it was sent from the, the web server on the internet. So knowing that I have to reconstruct it, reconstruct all those chunks into a single contiguous buffer, I wanted to do a sanity check. So I have all these chunks, I've put them all together, my buffer size is this. Now let me look in the HTTP headers from that original packet and see what was the content length. Well, sometimes I'm finding there's a mismatch. It's like I'm pretty certain I have all the information that was there, but for whatever reason, the content length in the HTTP header is like enormous. It's, it's tremendously large and it doesn't match what was actually sent. So. Not exactly sure what that means. It doesn't happen often, but I encountered it in you know, PCAP, uh, you know, just trial runs using PCAP, and I've encountered it operationally. So that goes to the weird log. If anyone can figure out you know, why the body size doesn't match the content length, I'd love to know. Um, and maybe we could, remove that, uh, we could remove that event. And then ICAP error events, just in case there's anything in the, in the underlying system that, that has a problem. An ICAP done, I generate that event when after a complete ICAP transaction has occurred, meaning there was an ICAP request followed by an ICAP response and after the HTTP analyzer has been invoked. So all the, the HTTP stuff has been pulled out, shoved into the HTTP analyzer. Then I consider it done and I use that done event to go ahead and start writing stuff to the ICAP log. Um, Hmm. All right, this is where it starts to get really ugly, <laughs> kind of technical. Um, just wanted to talk about some of the files. So here's where we look at the different body types. Um, so having a body type, I, I created this enum, and having a body type of none is okay because, well, maybe there's really was no body in the server response. The server could have just sent an error message back to the client request, so there really was no body. So the ICAT payload would have a, a body type of of, or I, I'm sorry, it's in the ICAP message when there's a 204 response, that's okay, because there's no body section there, no ICAP payload. Um, and then I just kind of said, all right, well, if there's a body type uh, where it's the request header, the response header, and the response body, that's one uh, value, or if it's just this or just that, and I kind of started encounter, I had to add a few of these, and that's, that's where the parser is kind of determining what the shape of the, what the, of the payload is. And down below is just kind of some of how the, in, within the bin pack language, how you define the ICAP request and how these different things are nested. So ICAP request is defined as an ICAP request line followed by an ICAP message. 
the ICAP request line is defined as a method with a URI and a version, et cetera. And that's kind of how, how BINPAC, um, how you, you make those declarations. And then the BINPAC compiler converts that all into C++ code for you so you don't make any mistakes. Yeah, so the ICAP message, uh, this is how, how I defined it. I kind of wrote this, wrote a, pro, wrote a function that goes ahead and parses the encapsulated header. There's probably a better way to do it. I probably could have done it with some let statement at the bottom, but just with my experience with Bro at the time and inexperience with BINPAC at the time, uh, this ended up being the most direct method to get uh, to accomplish what I needed to accomplish. So I created a function, get ICAP body type from NCAP header, and that goes through the encapsulated header, looks for those different strings, which kind of headers and bodies are present. It makes a determination and it returns that uh, enumeration field from the previous, or the enumeration value from the previous slide. And that's how it identifies which, which uh, body type format to use. Uh, ICAP analyzer.pack. This is a, uh, these are a lot of the routines that go ahead and generate the code. So I just highlighted these to say, well, there, there's a function that when it processes the ICAP request line, this function gets called. And what does this function do? Well, it generates an event that, you know, you could use in script land to capture or to uh, respond to that event. And then you could do stuff when that event occurs. Um, Going down a little bit is where the ICAP bodies are defined. I just have an XXX there, but it was all those different ABCD values. Um, once it identifies that and it pulls out the different pieces, then it invokes the uh, HTTP uh, protocol analyzer. And the HTTP protocol analyzers, there's, there's a few key, key functions in that one, or rather it's an ICAP analyzer, HTTP.pac. Uh, there's a top level function, invoke analyzer, and that just calls, you know, submit all headers or submit body. And one of the things I learned is that I, I had to submit the headers one by one um, into the HTTP analyzer. I had spent all this time writing this code to put all the HTTP headers back together sequentially. And then it didn't work. And I'm like, why doesn't it work? I had to go back and troubleshoot it and debug it. And I realized, oh, the HTTP analyzer wants each header line one by one. So I had to go ahead and remove all that code and just submit it one by one. Um, and then with the submit body routine, that's where I have to make the determination. I have to go back and find the original transfer encoding for the original HTTP message, if it was chunked or not chunked. And if it was not chunked, then I got to take all those chunks and reassemble them together. And I submit that as one big thing. If it is chunked, then, um, then I just submit it chunk by chunk down into the HTTP analyzer. So there, there were a couple of bugs and challenges using BINPAC. Uh, one of them I, I reported back to the bro issue tracker. This one I, I found a workaround on my own, so I was just kind of went with it. We, maybe we should address it. Um, but in the, in the C++ code, so there's ICAP, dot pack and it has all those uh, bin pack files that are associated with it. The bin pack compiler takes all those pack files, tries to turn it in or turns it into C++ code and it'll create this new file that gets put in the bro build directory called icap underscore pack dot cc. And I was getting a compile error in there. So bin pack was turning it into C++ but when that C++ was then compiled, I was getting an error. It couldn't find this variable body underscore and it was using it in this one function, um, ICAP message parse buffer, but it had never defined it anywhere. It was just expecting it to be there. So I just went back into the original ICAP.pac file. I said, well, I'll create this global variable called body underscore, and I'll give it some initial value. And then it was happy, and then it would compile, and, and everything's been working great ever since. Um, but that was just a, that was an unusual artifact of the bin pack to C++ conversion. And probably where... I could make that enumeration and that whole, whole part where it identifies what, what the ICAT payload looks like. If I make that a little more efficient and do that a little, a little better, it would probably address this error, wouldn't have surfaced. Um, I had a big problem with the chunk data, trying to, trying to get all the chunk encoded HTTP stuff out of the ICAT body. It wasn't working for me. It would read the, the chunk length, 
And then it would say, all right, where's the rest of it? Well, the rest of it was right there, but for some reason it wasn't, it wasn't identifying it. So I, I tracked it down. I was debugging all sorts of other code, and I found that there was this thing that I didn't control that was getting this value of negative one passed into it, which was telling it to ignore everything else that was there and expect more data. So I did submit a, a, a bro issue tracker on this one, and I worked with, with Vlad a little bit on it. And uh, he said, well, you know, change the way you're defining your chunk structures in the bin pack file. Do it like this instead. And um, so if anybody reviews the source code and you know, the bin pack code and you say, you know, some of this could be optimized. I could probably make this a little more efficient. You know, I thought the same thing, but it didn't work. So uh, we'll have it like this, and, uh, and it works. So the, the, some of the caveats and limitations. Um, the, the operational testing um, in the environment, only response modification mode is enabled. I believe the code was written, you know, generally enough. It should work for whether response or request modification or both are in the environment. But right now, I must admit, it's only response modification mode that's been operationally tested. Um, and options and preview, those, those types of transactions. Preview is a header type in the ICAP. Um, and options is a different method entirely. Those are just ignored. I mean, it's, it's logged that it occurred, but there's no processing. There's no, no value in it. Because if you go back to the objective, we want to be able to get the HTTP message out of there. Um, looking at the bro, uh, the connection identifiers and the four tuples, um, remember where bro is monitoring that link. So the IP addresses that it would see and put in the connection log would be that or are that of the web proxy and you know, the content inspection device. No, with the ICAP headers, knowing that the original client and server addresses are included in the ICAP headers, we could overcome that and change it so that in the HTTP logs anyway, you get the original client and the original server address in the HTTP log. So we're able to overcome that one. But when you look at the HTTP logs, the TCP port is always going to be 1344, either the source or the destination. One of them is going to be 1344, which is the ICAP port, because that information isn't preserved. Um, here's another interesting one. And this is a, not a limitation of bro. It's a limitation of how the, uh, how the web proxy operates. So that a single connection ID, a bro connection ID, um, it overlaps multiple unrelated user sessions. So if I'm the web proxy for this room and all of you have to go through me to access the internet, you know, your, get, your web page that you're looking at has 20 get requests and so does his and so does hers. Um, they all come to me. I'll make a TCP 1344 connection to the, to the ICAP server and I got your request, his request, her request and I just, I'll just send them all on the same TCP connection. Um, that's how the web proxy operates. So the same connection ID is applied to multiple um, unrelated user sessions. So in other cases, or in most other environments, the connection ID is useful in this case because of that limitation. It's not really useful. Um, the limitation between request modification mode and response modification mode. Um, request modification yields the HTTP request body that was uh, sent by the client. Response modification will give you the HTTP response from the server, um, but you need both modes of operation in order to get full visibility or else you'll have continue to have some blind spots. And the last one is, you know, transport layer. We have the, the web proxy device that is intercepting. It's the, the HTTPS, so the SSL um, connection but you still could have some sort of application that's, that's using that that still has some other sort of encryption um, on it. So it, it's, it's not going to be, you know, there could still be some blind spots, but uh, it will get you a lot more visibility than you had before. Um, all right, so summary, the last, second to the last slide. Uh, encrypted web traffic, it's a big blind spot. Everybody's encountered it on their network, and it's only going to get worse as time goes on. Uh, if you have a web proxy with content inspection services and it can do SSL interception, then the Bro ICAP analyzer, you could certainly use that in your environment to increase your visibility. 
The ICAP headers will give you the original IP addresses and it'll yield the user ID of who authenticated into the web proxy and it gives you a decrypted copy of the original HTTP messages. Uh, for future work, uh, would like to implement the request modification mode and get some testing done on that to make sure that all the code and, and uh, parsing works as designed. Uh, want perhaps revisit and optimize the bin pack code if possible, looking at the ICAP message uh, structure the encapsulated headers and, and maybe try to address that body underscore global variable that I had to introduce because of the bin pack compiler. Um, and lastly, to submit the bro ICAP analyzer back to the bro team um, for distribution or for download to everybody else. And we will be using the package manager, of course. So you got a couple of new projects that are gonna sign up to be guinea pigs. I mean, candidates for the new package manager. Um, and, oh, along the lines of, of submitting back to the, to submitting bro, I would love to be able to include test code and packet capture files um, to test the functionality. The problem is because any packet capture from the operational network of HTTPS traffic and then all that gets torn out, and there could be potentially sensitive information there that I would not to want to publish. Um, online for everyone to download to test the capability. Um, and in the environment, we don't have any extra web proxies. We don't have a development lab with a web proxy that's doing non-operational business. Um, so it's kind of hard. So if anyone um, you know, has an, a test environment where maybe they have a web proxy and they could get some of this ICAP traffic that is non-attributional and sanitized and those things. That would be great. I would appreciate that assistance so that we could uh, submit those PCAP files along with some testing scripts when, uh, when I submit bro. So that's all I have. Are there any questions? Uh, the question was what proxy, web proxy vendors um, did we use or test with and did we run into any implementation problems? Um, no, it, it was, I'd rather not mention the specific product that was used, but it was already operational in the environment. So it was, it was more of a, of a target of opportunity. You know, we, my customer can't invest in a, in a dedicated appliance to do SSL interception for everything leaving the network, but they do have this. All right, let's see, what can we do with this? And that's where we developed, you know, some goodness. Okay, the, the question was, have I used squid for kind of like the testing environment to come up with just uh, blank traffic or non-operational you know, non traffic. Uh, I, found, I found a Python-based ICAP server and a Python or, and a squid ICAP client, a squid compatible ICAP client. Um, it took me a long time. The, the ICAP server was using a Python version. I mean, it was old code from like 2004, 2005. So I had to go back and, I mean, it took me so long to find the dependencies because it was expecting certain Python functions that didn't exist today or were in a different module. I mean, it took me like all day to get that up and running. I just, no, I, I recognize it's out there, but I haven't dedicated the time because I had such a challenge doing the ICAP server. I didn't, I, I haven't yet dedicated the time to do the client yet, but good point. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, so the question was encountering the, the, the way the HTTP body entities are chunk encoded in the ICAP payload, it shouldn't matter to the bro I, I, HTTP analyzer. I should be able to send it in chunk encoded whether it was originally chunk encoded or not. I guess I didn't try that. I was afraid of breaking something or, or not getting good results. So I thought, well, yeah, I just I didn't know what the result would be, so I just put in the effort to reconstruct the chunks and submit it that way. It is when the HTTP body is encapsulated in the ICAT payload, it is chunk encoded. So when I pull it out of the ICAT payload, it's chunk encoded. So yeah, I mean, so, so that's what I do. If I, when I check the original, the HTTP headers to see what the transfer encoding, if it was chunked, then I'll go ahead and submit those chunks. 
But if it's not chunked, I wasn't sure if the HTTP analyzer would complain and say, I, I didn't know what kind of state it, it kept to say, wait a minute, the header said it should be, it do, the headers doesn't say that it's chunk encoded, but you're sending me a chunk encoded body. What's going on? Correct, correct. Uh, so the question was with the web proxy, does it require the, uh, like a trusted certificate so that everyone will, will be able to do an encrypted session to it? Right. Yes, it does. Okay, okay. What, uh, the question is what kind of ICAP servers did we use? Um, in this case, it was uh, antivirus inspection device that was, uh, I guess, came with the, the web proxy, you know, kind of as a pair from the same vendor. I said, here's the web proxy, and it does all these proxy things, and here's the antivirus thing that you could configure to inspect some or all of your traffic through the antivirus. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much.